uh, focusing on homelessness and mental health. Even though we're meeting today uh, from many different locations uh, through Zoom, let us acknowledge that Queens is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, to learn, and to play on these lands. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. So welcome again. Uh, today you will hear from some United Way agency partners about how your donations uh, through our campaign are helping them to address some of the very critical needs which face our communities right now. Specifically, you'll hear about how they are helping people address mental health challenges and homelessness. This is the first of two speaker events we are holding during the campaign this year. Next week at the same time, uh, we'll be hearing from agencies involved in addressing human trafficking, which is a very serious and startling problem in our city. These events have been offered to help everyone learn about the work being done in our community, and in particular about the needs that exist, particularly those that have been exacerbated by the pandemic and that affect the most vulnerable people in our community. A big part of our United Way campaign at Queen's is about awareness, cultivating awareness, increasing it of those issues and of the truly incredible work that is being done uh, by agencies through the support of the United Way. It is certainly inspiring, and I hope you will leave today uh, feeling as if you know a little more uh, about what is happening in your community and are inspired to contribute to the campaign and to this work. So now I'd like to introduce our discussion moderator today, Pavna Varma, who is the CEO and president of the United Way for Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington, uh, who will share some information about our topic and about our panelists today. Pavna, over to you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, firstly, thank you to Queen's faculty, staff, retirees, students for your support. Um, it is one of the largest workplace campaigns in the region. Most importantly, people from Queen's are really, really valued in our community for volunteering, for supporting, uh, for helping with some of the wicked issues that we deal with. Speaking of wicked issues, uh, one that's impacting our community and many communities across Canada is homelessness and mental health. Mental health is something that uh, you never know when it's gonna hit you. It's all of us at any time, we all know people or ourselves have been impacted by this issue. It's, it's prevalent, it's growing. What's really challenging is for people who don't have a home, people who are uh, without shelter. And that's where we have this amazing group of frontline agencies who work diligently every day, right through the pandemic to help make the lives of people who are going through these experiences a little easier. It's, it's difficult work, it's challenging work, it's complex work because everyone's path to homelessness is different. Everyone's journey is different and the solutions need to be different. But what we'll do today is speak with three of our agencies and talk to you about some of the things that they are addressing and their approach to how they're helping people who are in the most vulnerable uh, situations in our community. So uh, again, it's not, sometimes some people will, will respond right away and they'll be housed right away. But some people are really struggling just to deal, to stabilize themselves, uh, to get some supports. Housing by itself is not the only answer, it's providing the supports to help people be housed, stay housed. So I'm going to introduce you to um, Addictions and Mental Health Services of Kingston Front, Magdalenex and Addington, uh, to the Street Outreach Coordination Program through Home-Based Housing. And then we'll speak with uh, youth um, homelessness from the youth Kingston Youth Shelter. We'll speak about family mediation and their role in uh, prevention. So I'm going to start with uh, Carol Ravness, who's with who's the Executive Director of Programs at uh, Addictions and Mental Health Services. So Carol, over to you. Thank you, Pavna, and, and thank you so much, uh, Queen's University alumni and current uh, faculty for this opportunity uh, to speak to you today. 
those who are homeless are very likely to have addictions, mental health issues. And those with a serious addiction to mental health issues are have a much greater chance of being homeless. So is it the chicken, is it the egg? It's, it is, as Pavna said, a very wicked problem. And they're complex social issues that are reflective of our fabric of our society and people's access to resources, as well as how we view addictions and mental health. The truth of the people that we see at addictions mental health um, is that they're likely to be poor and living in poverty. They're likely to have very long standing trauma. They're likely to be very ill themselves. And they quite often have addiction issues. The street drugs that are available seem to be more addictive and more dangerous. And on a, uh, a medical rounds last week, there was a psychiatrist that said that he believes only 10% of them, if they put all their will to it, could quit. Most of them are not able to do that um, on their own and through their own willpower. So these are very challenging individuals to house. They need a lot of support. Um, they need to stabilize and they need to achieve some medical um, balance in their lives. So some of the challenges that we face, um, and again, it's not through, I'm not finger pointing, it's these are the realities. There's not enough shelter options. The point in time count done by the United Way on April 14th was there were 207 homeless people. And at that point, really affected by the pandemic, but also the overall count is not enough. There were only 67 shelter beds. So there just wasn't enough um, options for shelter. There's also not enough true housing options because shelter isn't the ultimate uh, solution. Finding somebody a place to live is the ultimate solution. And um, the housing that we're able to find for our clients is, is very expensive. It is uh, sometimes rat infested, mold infested, um, what they're able to afford. So we really don't have enough housing options and I really believe that what we need is graduated options because you can't go if you've had a long period of time homeless or you've had a long period of time of institutionalization, you can't go from that to living on your own in an apartment. It's not, we need more steps and having people to have a range of options where they can succeed, um, have support, graduate to the next um, more independent option, have success there and move on. There has also been policy changes that have really influenced the current situation. Deinstitutionalization, while done for all the right reasons, I don't think had enough support to truly help individuals who had lived a good portion of their lives in institutions to graduate into the community. So all in all, um, the housing supply does not match the need and there needs to be a lot more um, support and a lot more options that are affordable um, to clients with addiction mental health needs. What do we do at Addictions Mental Health to assist? We have a range of services and we're gonna help them with their, their mental health needs, their addiction needs, their housing needs, their whatever, whatever they need to support them. A lot of times it's learning how to live in a house, uh, activities of daily living, how to clean a house, how to create a budget, how to be successful in their housing. We also have access to psychiatry, which is a huge support um, and needed for a lot of the individuals we see. We do street outreach and you'll hear from Jay uh, shortly. We do street outreach and uh, connect people to care. And we advocate for services and change. We advocate for all of us to be aware of the stigma that comes along with addictions, mental health, and that we perpetuate um, the, the situation that a lot of people live in. And we're partners in care um, is in you know working with um, folks on this call to really to really improve the services to clients. How does the United Way help? And um, I just have to have a big smile on my face because it's a huge help. And your support of the United Way makes a big difference. Um, for us, they've supported us to have staffing positions. I talked about that outreach. United Way supported a nurse. And when during the pandemic, we've had outreach nurses that go up to people on the street. And when you're a nurse, it's sometimes less intimidating. And we talked to them about COVID and we gave them a cup of coffee and we helped um, to connect them to care. 
but they've also funded a family support worker, a youth worker, and other workers. United Way helped us with a COVID self-isolation center because there's no place for homeless to go. We don't want them going to the hospital to self-isolate during COVID if they had symptoms. But we use that self-isolation period to connect them to care. And we also, um, the United Way gave supplies. We need things uh, to run the self-isolation center to support people at home. And they, they gave us those basic supplies. The United Way is a fierce advocate for compassion and care and policy changes. They know the services in this community and they expect us to work together and, and they really work to knit us together. And why don't you go over there? How about the two of you work on this? So they're really a force of integration in a connected uh, community of service. And I just finally have a, just a very quick story. I hope I have time. We had a gentleman that came into the self-isolation center and his feet were absolutely black um, from um, sores and uh, lack of care. They uh, really had no more circulation going to them. They needed to be, really, if he'd gone to a hospital, they would have been amputated is what needed to happen. But this man, of, of sound, you know, he was able to, he had the capacity. He said, I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to lose my legs. So we kept him and we were able to uh, keep him longer at the isolation center, give him stable food. Um, nurse, we did find a physician that would come and treat him. We thought at any moment, we're going to, he's going to go septic on us. He's, he's, these legs are just not, he's not going to make it through. He did make it through and we actually were able to house this individual um, and honor his wishes of not going to hospital and having amputation while still supporting him medically in the community. That would not have been possible um, had we not had uh, the United Way in the support and had we not had the opportunity to really listen and work with this client on what he needed. Um, and he, his course was totally changed um, by that experience. So I'll close by saying thanks for the opportunity to give you a very brief glance into um, the, the challenges of homelessness and housing and addiction mental health. Thank you for your support of the United Way. It really does make a big difference um, to organizations like ours. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Um, really appreciate all the work you and your team do. I know you deal with individuals who are in the most vulnerable of circumstances and really appreciate the compassion and care that you and your team continue to demonstrate. So thank you. And speaking of compassion and care, Jay, I know you and your team do an awesome job with the street outreach. So I'll hand it over to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And thank you to the United Way uh, for uh, assisting us with funding to uh, support the individuals that Carol had expressed. Um, thank you to all the Queen's uh, staff and alumni who uh, continue to support United Way. Um, it is definitely needed in our city. Um, I'm sure most of you have noticed the increase of individuals who may be homeless in our city and, in, and around town. Um, during the pandemic, those numbers have increased. Um, so here at Home Based Housing, uh, our street outreach team is really focused on trying to connect with those individuals that are outside on a daily basis with nowhere else to go. Um, as Carol had stated, they are, uh, shelter systems are already full. Uh, there is not a lot of housing available and individuals are not there, they're not willing to take any type of housing because as Carlos has stated, the housing is inadequate. Um, so our job is on a daily basis to make sure people have their basic needs, to make sure that they're fed, to make sure that they know that services are available to them to find housing, to find support, uh, to find something that might be meaningful to them rather than sleeping on the street. Uh, we have three staff here that do uh, seven days a week of street outreach. Uh, and what we've really noticed is, as Carol stated, the majority of the clients that we work with uh, are not looking for housing because they are so deep within their drug addiction or their mental health has gone unmedicated for such a long time that they, they, they disassociate that they do have a mental health issue. 
Uh, so it's very hard to try to have conversations with individuals about housing when the main focus on a day would be to find the next available drug or you know they're so unwell that they they don't understand that living on the street may not be very conducive to their well-being uh, so we really focus on trying to make sure that people uh, know that there are other options available uh, we do advocate strongly uh, to the city uh, about the issues that we see every day um, and we're trying we're trying to make a difference in individuals lives even if it's just a small little bit uh, we do provide harm reduction supplies as well uh, because we do know that clients are going to use and we want to make sure that they are safe um, one of the questions that says is you know what your agency does to help people with mental health and addictions we are not the experts but we do deal with mental health and addictions on a daily basis we do the best we can we call on our partners from AMHS and other organizations to assist us when uh, a client may be having a mental health crisis. Um, but we are not there to push the mental health um, programs or the housing programs on these individuals. We are there to create relationships, to create um, a sense of community among the homeless individuals so that they can feel welcomed in the general society um, it, it really is difficult for individuals who are walking around downtown, pushing a shopping cart to feel as though they belong in the city. And I think it's very important that we all remember that they are still a citizen of the city of Kingston, and we need to be treating each and every one of us as we would want to be treated. Um, how is the United Way dollars um, assisting us here at home base? Well, thankfully, United Way has um, provided funding for a street outreach uh, case manager uh, whose focus really is on connecting individuals to service. Uh, it's allowed us to be able to uh, provide service seven days a week, uh, which we were not able to do with one staff. It's provided us the opportunity to cover a larger area. Uh, with one staff, we were focused mainly on downtown. But with the addition of the funding from United Way, we've been able to expand our, our, our area. Uh, we are, you know, there are homeless individuals all over the city. It is not just one centered area downtown. Um, as for a story that I'd like to talk, talk to you about, you know, Carol talked about the individual that she, they were able to assist. We have those stories every single day. It's the gentleman who may have been sleeping rough for the last five years, but we have finally created that relationship uh, and, and trust with that individual that they would want to access shelter. It's the individual downtown who had been using for the last five years uh, is on Ontario Works and cannot afford to rent a house, or sorry, an apartment, but they've gone to MHS, they've worked on their addiction, they've now been housed for four years. So it's really about those little small moments when you know that you've really helped somebody, even though it may not be the end goal. It may not be housing, but it's getting them the connections and the support and services that they need in their moment. And uh, United Way has been a great, great partner. Um, and uh, we appreciate everything that they do. And we appreciate everything that anybody who has provided a donation to United Way, because it does make a huge difference in our society. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Um, I really appreciate that. And I should have mentioned also that in the point in time count that Carol referenced, uh, we did find that 30% of people who are homeless identify or have Indigenous uh, uh, heritage. So we are uh, just introducing a new program with an Indigenous worker uh, working closely with Jay's colleagues, uh, case manager who will be downtown. And we're hoping to introduce Indigenous programs in every uh, agency that serves people who are homeless, because that is a critical issue. And Jay, you mentioned a sense of belonging. I think one of the things that the United Way strives for, with all your help, is to help people in our community live with hope, dignity, and a sense of belonging. And you certainly bring that to the work you do. So thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Vivian Parent, who is with Kingston Youth Shelter. Uh, the United Way worked with all our partner agencies to create a plan uh, to address and end youth homelessness in our community. One of the things that youth told us, because we engaged a lot of youth to try to understand the issue better, 
they said that the number one reason they were homeless was family conflict. And as a result of that, we, the program has been created by our community and is delivered through Kingston Youth Shelter. And Vivian will tell you about the amazing job that, that their program does uh, in our community. So Vivian. Hi everyone. Thank you so much to Queen's staff, students, alumni for hosting this event and allowing us to tell you about the important work that we do and the ways in which United Way supports our agencies. So the Kingston Youth Shelter serves youth ages 16 to 24, and we offer a three-prong approach to ending youth homelessness, which includes emergency shelter, transitional housing, and family mediation. And our emergency shelter and transition homes are wonderful, and they help youth that are already homeless, but family mediation is different because it aims to prevent homelessness. It's our one proactive approach. Um, so I've worked with youth that have stayed in the shelter, and I've worked with youth that have never left home. Um, the program started in 2015, and it's been very successful, helping 90% of the youth referred to either remain at home or to return home. Um, and because a youth doesn't need to be in shelter to receive family mediation, they can be referred from um, their family or adolescent care workers at school, um, family friends, it's been really helpful for youth that aren't able to enter shelter um, because they're not old enough, like 14 and 15 year olds. And I've noticed in the last year an increase of referrals for um, youth 14 and 15. And it's also just been one of the busiest years, probably the busiest year for the shelter. Um, and because the majority of our services are for youth 16 to 24, it doesn't really respond to the, the trauma and the family conflict that these kids have been experiencing that starts way before they turn 16. Um, so to respond to that issue, family mediation has expanded to help younger teens um, that are at risk of homelessness. Um, and that reduces the chance that those teens are ever going to access shelter when they're older. And that's really our mission is to ensure that homeless youth don't become homeless adults. Um, and we want to remove as many barriers to accessing service as possible. So I serve the entire KFLNA area, and I'm able to meet families when and where is most comfortable for them. So that means I'm meeting families in coffee shops, in their homes, in parks, wherever they need to meet. And often that is after school hours or after work hours for the parents. Um, recently, I helped a 14-year-old girl who was living out in the country with her grandparents. Um, her parents were deemed unfit to raise her and her siblings, and all the kids were placed with the grandparents. And as you can imagine, the grandparents were having a really difficult time adjusting to parenting three kids. And they were also having a really hard time in particular with this 14-year-old girl who was struggling with her mental health and trying and failing to navigate virtual school. And the entire family was really finding it hard to cope with COVID restrictions and the pandemic just escalated a lot of the conflict at home. And they were arguing constantly and the youth, um, the girl was in and out of the emergency room for mental health crises. And at one point she felt like there was no option but to leave and to try to at least couch surf at a friend's house or even sleep out in the woods. Um, and the family was connected to me, thankfully, and they were able, I was able to meet with them in their home weekly and help them work through these issues and find solutions together. And I'm really happy to share that after working with them for a few months, she never left home. Um, she's been doing well. She's starting to feel comfortable enough in her new environment that she's not accessing emergency services at the hospital. And she's even started, you know, trying to plan movie nights with her grandparents. So that, that was really lovely to hear. Um, so not only has the United Way funded the family mediation program, they started this whole thing and it's, it's just been a wonderful program, but they also helped us tremendously during the pandemic. Um, they helped us move to a new location, which allowed our essential services to keep going without interruption. Um, our old location on Brock Street had 15 beds in communal rooms, but of course, when the pandemic started, we couldn't have youth staying in such close quarters. So they, uh, that number went down from 15 to four <laughs> until we moved. Um, and then we had 18 individual rooms for youth, which was super important for social distancing, um, youth that needed to self-isolate, 
um, and in general, reducing the risk of COVID-19 amongst the homeless population. Um, and they also helped us with all kinds of things like providing commercial cleaning services, money for groceries, TVs and tablets for youth that had to self-isolate, um, cell phones for youth to stay connected to their supports and their families. Honestly, without the support of the United Way, I don't know how our agency would have made it through the pandemic. Um, so all of us at the Kingston Youth Shelter are really just so thankful for the United Way, for all the campaigns that you're running at Queens, the donations that you've raised. Um, it just makes it possible for us to do this work and help these young folks that are just trying so hard to get back on their feet. Thank you, Vivian. That was a very moving story. And I'm so glad you're there to help families and youth. And I hope people who are watching this, if you know anyone who needs help, feel free to call uh, Vivian. Feel free if you want to connect with any of our speakers to let me know and we'll connect you or Mary Beth uh, from Queens will connect you with them. So we really appreciate that. And it's wonderful that youth actually have a safe space. And as Vivian said, our whole goal with uh, you, the work we're doing on youth homelessness is to help youth at that stage in life so that they do not end up adults who are homeless. And uh, we really believe in the prevention work that you do. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so I will turn it back to, uh, I understand, uh, I don't know, Patrick, do you have any questions or any comments for our speakers? Uh, thanks, Pavna. Um, uh, hang on a sec. Let me just get myself off mute here. Uh, thanks to all three of you for those really in inspiring uh, talks. It, what, what struck me listening to you is how interconnected these problems all are. You know, your organizations are dealing with, you know, particular manifestations of a broader social uh, challenge. And I was just wondering about um, the extent to which you're able to coordinate. So I can see that the, the United Way has provided specific help. Um, and I, I think, you know, from where I sit uh, on the United Way cabinet, I th think of the organization as being a point of confluence, right? There's a, a, a place where these concerns come together. Can you just talk a bit about how you how you work with each other to, to address uh, these challenges? Because they really do seem to require a collaborative complex set of solutions, which are really difficult to deliver when you're challenged in so many ways from a staffing point of view, a logistic point of view, and, and so on. Just interested in your thoughts on, on how, you know, how the parts add up to a really, really effective whole uh, in our community. Carol, Joe, go ahead. Thanks, thanks for the question, because it is very complex. And these are individuals with uh, multiple needs. Uh, two things come to mind as I let my co-panelists co think of other, other things to add to my answer. Um, one would be we purposely integrate care. So I think of Jay's program and the outreach. The addictions mental health team visits with them and uh, street health another provider. So we try to be very purposeful about uh, being present together as we help with clients um, or pulling each other in as that becomes necessary and evident. And we have a, a youth case manager that works, I, I think he's now almost exclusively at uh, the youth shelter or spends a good portion of every day there, again, to try and support the work um, that is done there. Uh, the other, so that that kind of you know, just being very strategic about how our teams work together. The other thing that the United Way though has done um, is, is this whole problem of homelessness and housing and insufficient housing. Um, Pafna and uh, actually Susan Stewart from the Health Unit have pulled together a collective impact uh, group to really as a community with political, with um, municipal, with social services, with health, um, you know, regional reps. Um, this is a very wicked problem and we need to think about solutions. So they pull together a group that's going to really come up with solutions and, and uh, have our collective voice see those put into action. Thanks, Carol. That's, that's extremely helpful to know. Yeah, collective impact action is, is clearly what's needed. Yeah. Vivian or Jay, any, any comments? I can, I, I'd love to add to what Carol had said. Um, I think we all know that working in silos in this type of field 
doesn't work. Uh, before 2015, before the city brought out their 10-year um, homelessness plan, um, we really were working in silos. Um, but with the addition of United Way, um, we've really known that working together is the only way we are going to make a difference. Um, and it, it is really great to be able to call on the experts. Again, I've stated before, we are, we are not mental health workers. We do deal with mental health and addictions every single day, but to have our partners at AMHS who do work with mental health and addictions on a daily basis, be readily available to support us, to support the clients. It, it, it's, it, it's, so, it's so important. Um, and then you even look at the youth shelter. I know uh, Vivian and I probably have not actually met, but I can, I can tell you that both of our agencies are working diligently together to support youth because we, it is true, Vivian has stated, the moment they become homeless and they join the adult shelter, it's just another barrier to them to becoming housed. Uh, it is a, a vicious cycle that continues. So being able to work together collaboratively, not only with the United Way partners, but with all partners throughout the city uh, who deal with mental health and addictions and homelessness, it has to happen or else we will never find the answers uh, and never find a solution. Thanks, Jay. Vivian. Yeah, I just I just like to add that I I wasn't uh, in this role before when it felt more like we were all working in silos. Um, I came into this and it immediately felt very collaborative um, with the committee that we have at the United Way and all their uh, agencies that they fund. Um, it's always just felt like all of Kingston and all of these agencies are all working together to like help all of these individuals and. I don't think a day goes by without us, you know, reaching out to a community partner to get some help with, with an area where we're not experts and we really do need to connect uh, youth to these services and we're all just working together to lift up these, these youth, so. Thanks for being, this is uh, very encouraging. I, it looks like, uh, do we have a question from Patricia, Mary Beth? some discussion in the chat about, uh, about. Can you unmute to ask your question? You're not able to do it uh, for Patricia, are you Mary Beth? No, unfortunately I, I can't. So Patricia, if you could unmute to ask your question or put it in the chat. Okay. There we go. Sorry to be such a hold up. Excuse my nose, I had some problem with it. Um, my concern uh, is always the same thing. I was, for years and years, I was very involved with advocacy for serious mental illness. And now we've got all these people increasing on the street. And I want to know how you, how your group, because I, I was quite impressed with what you said, by the way, um, how you, you actually recognize when somebody has a serious mental illness. And we've got to start using the word illness, not necessarily to the patient, but to the, the team of you. How do you recognize and how do you refer promptly so there might be an intervention at a more appropriate time than allowing the person just to bowl along, living from hand to mouth? And sometimes you're obviously you're going to be involved with people, families who are not, haven't caused the problem, but are trying to deal with the problem. And obviously there'll, there'll be conflicts around that. So how do you access the right kind of help? for the three to 5% of people that are actually living with a serious mental illness, which is nobody's fault, but nevertheless, it needs to have medical prompt attention. And I, I imagine that all of you are coming across this on a regular basis. Certainly, I, I will add to Patrick Dean, when I'm walking around the campus, looking at all the awful things that are going on there, I see several individuals who are clearly very psychotic and not necessarily into drugs, but just actively psychotic. One of them was actually giving some of the students some very good advice the other day, get your heads down and stop, stop falling around. But nevertheless, he was totally mad. 
and he needed, and I use the word illness and madness in the same category. That may offend some of you, but nevertheless, you've got to call it what it is and then get on and help the person out of their tricky situation. Maybe we'll, we'll start with Carol. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great question, Pat, Patricia. It is a great question and it, it can be very, very distressing to see somebody in, in that uh, situation. So um, the first thing that we try to do is, uh, to Jay's earlier point, is a relationship. Unless a person is, is so ill that they just, they cannot go there at all. They can't even talk to you about it. But a lot of times it's approaching them very gently and developing a relationship with them and talking to them about their needs. Um, and quite often you need to start with needs that, like, have they eaten? Um, when did they last sleep? Um, where where do they stay um, and try and help them with some very basic needs. Again, if, if they're clearly a danger to themselves or others, then you have to act on that. And, and we do have um, mental health workers that uh, work with police and, and come out and try to assess and get people into the appropriate care um, through the hospital system and Providence care. But initially what we're trying to do is develop a relationship we're trying to develop trust. They often are very mistrustful of um, individuals and have had bad experiences. Um, we try to uh, facilitate an access to um, psychiatric care. And we are so fortunate now to have four psychiatrists uh, working with our organization through a relationship. It happens to be with Queen's University um, and Dr. Claudio Soros, um, Kingston Psychiatric Partners, because they really do need to have somebody um, assess them from a psychiatric point of view. We also need to connect them to care. A lot of them have physical needs um, that have been neglected for a very long time. So it's, it's one step at a time. And uh, again, unless it's a, a danger, um, it's trying to work sequentially with them and it is with them um, because if you move too fast, you'll scare them and you scare them off. And, and so, um, you know, really trying to connect them to that care. Sometimes we've known them before. We have people that, um, you know, mental health illness and we do need to call it an illness is a life journey. So people often cycle in and out depending on what happens to them. And we, we, you know, build on that knowledge we might have from before and, and also uh, really try to um, put them on a pathway to better health. Um, but that, that will take a long time. Um, and it takes a lot of, a lot of protecting that relationship. Um, the other thing that I would say, and again, it's thanks to United Way, we have a family support program that wasn't in place um, before last year because it's very distressing for families and they're trying to figure out how do I help? How do I support? Um, and, and so it's, it's really helpful to have families have somebody separate for them um, to, to provide guidance and advice and, and a place where they can talk freely. Um, so, so those are some of the things that we do. Um, it certainly is in concert with, uh, with police, with home-based housing, um, with other providers, sometimes it's with street uh, business owners, uh, just really trying to reach people and uh, provide help and support. Thanks, that Carol. I know we have a couple of minutes, so I'll turn it over to Jay and Vivian if you have anything to add. I will say, uh, Patricia, that we have noted uh, in, in our youth homelessness plan, the need for us to also support families uh, of youth who are going through, through this journey. So Jay, Vivian, anything you wanna add quickly? I know we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, yeah, I, I think Carol spoke uh, quite well about um, how we tackle these issues on a daily basis. Um, I, reminder that, you know, majority of the individuals who you see around town have been dealing with that mental illness for years, unmedicated, untreated. Um, you know, most of them have not seen a doctor in years. So it really is trying to create that relationship. And as Carol said, trust in the services that are available to them, that we are there to do something, you know, well for them, to support them, walk through those services, to, to get them to a better spot in their lives. Uh, but it really does start with just treating them like a human being. Um, one thing I did want to say uh, to Patricia's question was, 
you know, there's not a lot we can do though when it comes to pushing an individual or supporting an individual to access those services. Services are voluntary, um, you know, and if th that individual is not hurting themselves or somebody else in the moment, there is not much we can do to support them if they do not want to be supported. Uh, the Mental Health Act, although it's there, very difficult to put in place by the police when an individual is, is unwell um, or is having a mental illness crisis. Um, you know, unless that individual is actually harming themselves or somebody else in the presence of a police officer, there is not much the police can do. Uh, so it is very difficult to get somebody assessed at the hospital very difficult to get somebody to trust us uh, to connect them with AMHS. Uh, we do our best, AMHS does their best, but again, it's voluntary. So we just do the best that we can. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Vivian, one quick comment and then we'll hand it back to Dr. Dean. Yeah, Jay and Carol said it very well. Um, we see a lot of people with serious mental illness at the youth shelter um, and it's mainly working on that relationship, getting them to trust the staff that are here and making sure that we take care of those basic needs as well. You know, they have a place to sleep that's safe, uh, that's comfortable, they have access to food, they can, you know, take a shower, take a bath, like all of those things are just so important for really boosting someone's um, mental health and also their trust in an environment and in the staff that are there. So that's how we're, we're helping them and just trying to encourage them to access those services and, and supporting them when we can. Thank you. Patrick, back to you. Uh, thanks, Pavna. And uh, thanks again to, uh, to uh, Vivian and to Jay and to Carol, uh, a really, really engaging conversation today. I think that that last point Jay made, which you've each uh, elaborated upon, really brings home the challenge of this work. Uh, it is one thing to support individuals who know what support they need um, and are eager to reach out and, and uh, and secure it, it's an entirely different thing to provide supports to individuals who, have, who, who don't understand the need for the support and what is in their own interests. So I, um, I really greatly admire the, the work you do for just that reason. The, there's, there's, there's no more difficult thing to do and the stakes are extremely high um, for these individuals and for all of us. So thanks, thanks uh, to all, all three of you, and thanks, uh, Pavna, uh, for, for joining us today uh, for this session. Uh, I just, in closing, would uh, like to make the point that Queen's historically has been extremely generous in its response to the United Way. We are a leader within the uh, overall United Way campaign, and we have this year a campaign goal of $425,000, which is just over uh, 10 percent of the entire community campaign goal. Um, we're the largest uh, workplace and retiree campaign in eastern Ontario and uh, we can be proud of that uh, and grateful to everyone who has contributed uh, and supported the United Way through this campaign so far and in past years and we thank everyone in anticipation of their continuing support for the kind of exemplary valuable and indispensable work that our, our, our three guests and their agencies do for our community. So thank you everyone. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to, to having you join us next week uh, for the second of these, these sessions. So thank you very much again. And I hope you have a great afternoon.